Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Thomas Binder. I'm the founder of 123 Sonography and I'm very, very happy to have all of you with us on this very, very first Q&A session on the topic of vascular ultrasound. And of course, I'm very, very happy that we have Julie Cardoza from us who's going to be holding the webinar from New Jersey and she'll be answering all the burning questions that you might have. So Julie, thanks for being with us and welcome. Thank you so much for having me be a part of this. And I'm extremely excited to uh, talk to all the viewers today and go through some questions. Right, what we have of course, is we have a bunch of questions already that uh, users have sent us. So these questions we prepared, we prepared some answers to those, but we're very, very happy if you could also send us your questions, because that's obviously the sense of having a Q&A session. So you have a little chat box where you can simply send us those questions. And as we go along, I'm also going to maybe ask some questions to you. Uh, you can, of course, answer yes and no questions, and uh, it'll give us a little bit of information about who you actually are, um, and uh, maybe help us a little bit more in uh, adapting to our answers to what your needs are. So um, the, this webinar is actually the very first time that we're doing a Q&A session. We've done webinars in the past and uh, we've had a lot of response here, but now we want to make it a little bit more, or let's put it this way, closer to maybe the, the users and the viewers so that we specifically focus on your questions. So I think before we waste too much time, let's jump right into the topic. And one of the questions uh, that uh, was asked was, how do you actually manipulate the transducer and how do you actually uh, name the different orientations? So Julie, what is your answer to this? Well, it's interesting as we were reviewing some of the questions, a lot of people had asked regarding probe movement and probe uh, probology, I guess I would want to say. Um, and I want to address the questions together as far as the movement of the probe and also regarding probology. So it's very important that we um, go to the first question from one of our users and address that one first, and then we'll address several others. So it says, is there a proper way to reference the position of the probe? I have heard it referred to several different ways, transverse, longitudinal, short, long, x-axis, and y-axis. So the common mistake is that we mix the reference to the anatomy versus the probe itself. So transverse and long refers to how you're imaging the vessel anatomy. Just wait with those slides real quick. So as you can see here, just go back. Okay, so here's the transducer. And go back to the Y. Back. Go back one more. Okay, there's a little bit of a delay in uh, the transmission. So is the, this is the Y. Right, so what I want to refer to is the X and Y axis. We can refer to the long portion of the transducer. Okay, so the Y axis is parallel to the long portion of the transducer face. Where the X axis, you can flip to the next slide. It's perpendicular to the long side of the transducer. Then we have the Z axis, go ahead to the next slide which is the third dimension, which is perpendicular to the transducer face. Can you click through? There we go. So that's the z-axis. So here is an image of me sliding in the y-axis. And if the vessel that I'm moving along the leg would be viewed in the longitudinal view. However, a common mistake is that we can mix it up when we're viewing uh, veins because they can often go in between the Y and the X plane. Click to the next one. So this is the probe maneuver of rotation. And this is, I'm actually changing how I'm lining up the transducer to the leg. So I'm going to rotate from the longitudinal view to the transverse view. And now you can go to the next one. And now you can see that I've rotated the probe. I am sliding along the x-axis. So the image would be displayed on my screen in the short axis view. And go to the next one. So this is the probe maneuver of rocking. 
I'm actually angling in between the Y plane and the leg. So Julie, and let me yeah. let me just uh, ask a question here. Um, you can actually see that the transducer at some point lifts off of the skin. Is that a problem usually? Um, no, it depends because when we're imaging different anatomy of the leg, uh, sometimes, especially veins, they're very tortuous and we're only seeing two dimensions. So this way, when we uh, rock the transducer, we can angle between those planes to get the different visualization of the vessel. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the angling where we're angling in between the X plane. And that will help us give a better visualization of the anatomy that we're looking on the leg. Okay. So I guess uh, there's a lot of maneuvers you can do with the transducer. Um, and obviously it's very, probably very important to also look at the image because um, that's what you'll be, of course, orientating your probe to. Right, Julie? You're actually orienting to uh, the leg, to whatever you're scanning. So that's why it's important to understand to refer to the long, the long portion of the transducer face. So this way, if you scan a patient's leg or if you scan an octobook, you're always orienting to the probe and not to the uh, individual you're scanning, whether it's an animal or a patient. Okay. Good. So I, I just got a question in from Rudd, which is maybe not a question uh, related to uh, the, the, the imaging skills or the imaging, but it's a question related to the courses you have because uh, as many of you might know, uh, Julie Cardozo has uh, now produced a course on vascular ultrasound with the lower extremities, but Rudd wants to know, will there also be other courses, uh, vascular courses? Uh, Julie, what are our plans? Maybe you can tell our users. Uh, we're very excited about the plans uh, that we have at 123 Sonography. We're actually working on producing the visceral course, which is going to uh, cover all the uh, the arteries and the abdomen, so be the aorta and all its branches, and also the visceral venous system, which would be the veins in the abdomen and also in the pelvic. So that's our next course. Uh, and we're going to review mm -hmm. as far as the protocols, anatomy, pathology, and how to assess these areas and answer clinical questions. Yes, that's, uh, that's our plan. We, we hope to launch actually three courses as Julie, uh, Julie just mentioned, and uh, we hope to have them online in uh, 2019. So those are one of the main projects we'll be working on. Um, of course, we'll be launching one after the other uh, so that you get the full scope of vascular ultrasound. Um, maybe uh, just, just as an information for me, um, how many of you out there are already using vascular ultrasound presently? So it's just a yes and no question. Do you use vascular ultrasound already? Please answer with yes. And if you don't have any experience, please answer with no. So I'm um, just trying to get some information for you. Uh, so while we uh, get the feedback from you, uh, maybe we can turn to the next topic or the next question, which was ultrasound ergonomics. And uh, the question here was, I work in the imaging lab of a high volume practice and I find that my wrist is always hurting at the end of a long day. Is there anything I can do to alleviate this? This was from Jessica. Uh, Julie, a problem I guess we all face. Yeah, and, and this is a topic dear to my heart is ergonomics because again, you know, this is our career and we want to be able to uh, practice do an ultrasound in ergonomic ways as far as positioning our, our whole body. So this way we have longevity of our field. We actually did an insert uh, from the course, which we can show a quick video talking about ergonomics and how to get uh, your lab set up correctly. So um, here's the video, which is actually taken from the course. Now that we have oriented ourselves, there's one more thing we must consider before manipulating the transducer. Remember that properly setting the ultrasound environment will not guarantee proper ergonomics. The most important thing is for the sonographer to follow proper ergonomic techniques. The position of your arms should be as proximal to your body as possible while being comfortable. Specifically, the abduction of your arms should not exceed 30 degrees. The target vessel that we are scanning should be around the same height as your elbow with the forearm parallel to the floor. 
This is why we raise the patient's bed when setting up our ultrasound environment. Furthermore, your arms should have a solid base of support. Holding your arm in the air for the entire part of the examination is not ergonomically viable. I recommend to use wedges for arm support. However, if there is not one available, a natural alternative would be to rest your arm gently on the patient's lower extremity. <clears throat> Do not forget to ask the patient permission before doing this. Moving distally, we must also consider the wrist. Just like the arm, it should be aligned in a natural position. Ensure that your wrist is neither too flexed or too extended. The most frequent mistake seen in the vascular imaging field is overextension of the wrist. Okay, I think this really, really uh, summarizes the nicely how you can help yourself so that you don't get problems. Um, you know, I just recently read a statistics and it was, I must say, a very eye-opening statistics. It said that after only six months of people on the job in ultrasound, uh, practically 20% already have some problem with, uh, you know, their musculoskeletal system. And if someone works for an extended period of time over 10 or 15 years, it's almost 70 to 80%, which is an astonishing figure, but it only shows how important this topic is to all of us. And I think it's something that uh, we as a, you know, one, two, three sonography want to focus on more in the future because, you know, we, we really think that we should also um, be cautious of how we image. It's not only the beauties of these images, but also we need to take care of ourselves. And there's a lot of things you can do. Um, and um, this is something we'll definitely put into some course uh, in a later stage. So um, I'm a cardiology guy and we do echoes and we have very similar problems. We have the problem of patients being obese. You have to, of course, you know, if you, especially if you scan from the right side, you have to grip over the patient. And it's, it's a lot of strain that you have on your, on your uh, musculoskeletal system. So very important tips here. And not only that, I mean, uh, we all start with the death grip of the transducer because we're so focused on getting the right image and just over gripping the transducer alone is causing stress on your wrist. So um, I'm excited to develop that content with you guys as far as ergonomic positions, both for all modalities of ultrasound. Yeah, I think it's uh, so many issues. It's also how hard should you actually press? Uh, sometimes we're just, you know, over pressing and uh, that causes a lot of strain. Sometimes it's not necessary. Um, and these are issues that, that have been actually looked on also uh, in research publications, uh, you know, trying to figure out how much the pressure needs to be. So there is a lot of, um, you know, studies being done in this area as well. And I think it's very important too. Uh, let me come back to the questions that uh, we get back and uh, it's 54% uh, uh, of the uh, users here have actually already done vascular ultrasound. Uh, so there's a significant of numbers who are relatively new. Of course, I'm aware that uh, maybe you might have not uh, been using all the different parts of the vascular system when it comes to imaging, but um, it's, it's exciting because I think it's an area that is growing tremendously. And maybe, Julie, uh, you can say something about the importance of vascular ultrasound. Uh, just the fact that ultrasound in general, and particularly for vascular, it really helps with the management of the patient. I mean, these physicians are really looking to answer the clinical question quickly. And ultrasound is real-time information mm. that we can actually image the vessel of interest, whether it's an artery or a vein, to figure out what's going on in order to manage that patient effectively. And again, you know, with the facilities that I work at, these patients are, you know, advanced disease, um, CLI patients, critical limb schema. So, you know, this is their last resort before amputation. So it's crucial to get the accurate information if there's a vessel open so they can get blood flow to the foot. And also for um, veins, for DVT, deep venous thrombosis, um, whether the patient has a DVT or not, and if there is a DVT, what stage is it? Um, so we're just excited to have this opportunity to share with the world, like how you can get to that information and that question quickly and ultrasound and how to get it. Right. I think, you know, from my perspective is uh, very similar. Uh, what I can add, though, is that, you know, we, we as, uh, you know, cardiologists, uh, if we have an ultrasound machine, all you need to do is just get another transducer and you're also in the race for the vascular system and the vessels are connected to the heart and there's so much information you can get out of it. I mean, DVT is such a beautiful example 
Uh, how often do you have a patient uh, where you have the suspicion that they might maybe have pulmonary embolism? And you know, it's very nice to just use the same, tra well, a different transducer, but use it on a different part of the body, and you can actually you know, find the cause of that as well. And there's so many connections, you know, coronary artery disease and the keratids, for example, or you know, aortic dissection and seeing if uh, you know, dissection membrane goes all the way up to the keratids. I'm not hearing Julie at the moment. Yeah. So um, the image is frozen at the moment. Okay. I guess we had a just very short interruption. The image was frozen, but I do hope uh, all of you hear us. Uh, let's go to the next question. And um, this is a question from Melanie and she wants to know, do you have any tips for managing patients that are wheelchair bound or have leg braces that get in the way. How, how do you manage these patients, Julie? Yeah, so um, very creatively, uh, but also we want to take into consideration ergonomics. So fortunately, some facilities may have um, lifts that they use to lift these patients out of the wheelchair onto the bed in which you can assess the patient appropriately according to your protocol. But some facilities do not have access to lifts to get the patient out of the wheelchair. So we have to be creative. So we can assess these patients in a wheelchair, but we just got to be carefully and thoughtfully doing this um, by having the patient, you know, lean back so we can get into their groin region. A little interruption here. Okay. So uh, let me just, um, um, yeah, let me just go to the next question here. And uh, this is a question from Henry and he wants to know, I noticed that you use a venous pump in many of the vascular videos. How important is this for vein practice to have this? So Julie, what is your take on this? You have the image of the pump? Yeah, here's the image of the pump. There we go. Uh, the pump is effective in several ways. One, ergonomically for the patient and for the sonographer. Um, also, it produces no, it, it, there is no variability as far as augmentation maneuvers because it will be the same amount of pressure applied at different portions of the leg uh, for augmentation. So two reasons, one, ergonomics, and variability between uh, sonographers as far as the augmentation. So here's the uh, the clip. This lumen. I'm going to go ahead and perform a distal augmentation maneuver right now. Very nice. Go ahead, freeze that image. Perfect. Okay, so this is a. Is it a lot of uh, more work to have these uh, instruments in the lab? It probably it's a little bit more time consuming, I would assume, right? So we have a little bit of a break here. Um, I guess, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so obviously, you know, these, uh, parts of the exam a little bit more time con uh, consuming, I would assume, but nevertheless, I think it does give you more help. Um, uh, Julie could use a question maybe for me. Um, you know, I do see that at least again in cardiology, we have patients with uh, different imaging qualities. Uh, what are some of the biggest problems that you face in your laboratory when it comes to having good image quality? Okay, I don't know if you can hear Julie now. I'm not hearing her. I guess there must be a little bit of a node in the connection to her. But maybe, you know, um, let me just say a few things about uh, the, uh, the, the program that we have running with um, a platform that features now different modalities of ultrasound. Um, you know, we started this whole 
of course project in 2009 and 2010 we launched our first course and we uh, obviously did have a lot of uh, courses on echocardiography online but we do think that it's very important that we should move to other areas of ultrasound as well and so vascular ultrasound is definitely a very very important topic but uh, you know we're also including now musculoskeletal ultrasound and we're also including uh, modalities such as emergency ultrasound um, um, so uh, let me just interrupt here shortly we need to I'm maybe back. reset yeah you're back okay I got it. good okay, okay. So maybe, maybe let me repeat the question. And the question is, uh, what are the biggest challenges you face when it comes to getting good image quality on the legs? Well, we got to use the different tools in our toolbox, right? So we got to know uh, the knobology of the ultrasound system and how to optimize our image, whatever transducer we're using. But for instance, when reviewing the veins or the artery in a patient with a higher BMI in the mid thigh to distal region, it's important that we understand that with a linear transducer, we're not going to get good penetration greater than four centimeters depth. So at this point, I would utilize the curvilinear transducer, which is a lower frequency transducer that will allow me to penetrate deeper into the body um, to view this vessel. And again, knowing about the knobology. So we want to make sure we know how to adjust our frequency to make it lower, to image deeper into the body, our, our gain settings, and also our time gain compensation. So th those are the three basic functions as far as how to get a, a good image of uh, vessels that are deeper into the body. Okay. Uh, what are the, the biggest, uh, the dip most difficult patients? Are the, is it the obese patient or what about patients who have very muscular legs? Is that also an issue? Um, muscular, it depends. It depends on where we're insinuating, whether it's the calf or the thigh. Um, usually it's patients that have, you know, uh, a lot of edema, cellulitis, um, you know, advanced stages of arterial and venous disease where the skin is necrosis and there's wounds. You know, these patients are really hard to image, uh, and also patients with higher BMIs. Okay. So, uh, definitely a problem, but I guess with the advances in ultrasound with transducer technology increasing dramatically. Uh, I guess uh, we'll be imaging patients who are very, very difficult to image now, maybe in the future with even terrific image quality. And uh, maybe just uh, to mention uh, what some of the advances are in ultrasound technology. Uh, one thing that we are maybe not so aware of is that we're using a fixed number for the speed of ultrasound in tissue. And this number that we're using actually is the basis of the image we get. And sometimes uh, different patients have different speeds of ultrasound. And in the future, the ultrasound transducers will be able to sense what the true velocity of ultrasound is in the tissue and adapt to that. And that I think will bring a tremendous advance in the quality of ultrasound. So this is just one of the advances which are coming up. And um, you know, I, I, I still believe Quality improvement in 2D ultrasound is probably the biggest advancement that we've seen in the last maybe 10, 15 years. Of course, we talk about all sorts of modalities, but um, definitely it is the technology of better image quality, which has helped us more and more. Um, let's go to the next question uh, that has been posed, and that is the topic of venous evaluation protocols and techniques. Julie, do you want to say anything about that? Uh, well, I, I'm very interested to see what the viewers have to ask uh, regarding this. Um, yes, the question we get from yes, the question we got from Suresh was, how can I ensure that I do not miss a thrombus during post endovenous ablation surveillance? Yeah, this is a very important uh, question, and thank you for this. It's important that we assess, you know, the deep system first, right, to make sure that it's patent, but also whatever vein that was treated with an ablation, where the termination point is. Because sometimes when they use heat to ablate a vein, there's something called an E-hit, which is an endovenous heat-induced thrombus extension. And what happens is, is that it, this extension goes into the deep system, whether it's through the saphenofemoral junction from the great saphenous vein or the anterior accessory saphenous vein, or if were, uh, the small saphenous vein was treated Sometimes this extension can go into the popliteal vein at the saphenal popliteal junction. So it's important that we assess these areas both in the transverse view and get a lay of the land first 
and not start right away with our compression maneuvers because we don't know what we're encountering, especially when we go to this loop here. You can see, um, looking at the common femoral vein going into the saphenal femoral junction in the transverse view, notice how I'm not compressing and I'm getting a lay of the land and you can see um, echogenicity in this lumen. So this is a heat-induced thrombus extension and we're gonna visualize this in the longitudinal view Go to the next step. And as you can see, the free floating thrombus to the left of your screen is why I say do not do your compression maneuvers first, because if you do, this could potentially dislodge and cause the patient a pulmonary embolism. Uh, this is a beautiful picture of the extension going into the deep system from the great saphenous vein. And you can see with B flow imaging in our next clip how this thrombus is taking up more than 50% of the looming of the common femoral vein. Mm -hmm. uh, those are spectacular images. Can you maybe say, say a few words about uh, the B-mode imaging and what the advantages are here? The B-flow imaging? Yes. Uh, well, this is uh, a feature that is uh, on an ultrasound system that I utilize instead of color flow imaging. It gives me an angiographic view of the tissue of the thrombus, and, and I can really see where the flow and if there's collaterals may be. And you can see on the top portion of your screen, there's flow right above the thrombus extension in the great saphenous vein. So this is very helpful as I go to surveillance the patient as they're going for management. Because we're, again, we're gonna see patients like this uh, every, I guess every week to see how the thrombus is progressing back into the superficial system and dissolving. Okay. Um, here we got a question now from Mark, and he wants to know, how can I be sure uh, if it's an artery or a vein? Uh, a very basic question, uh, but I think a very important one. Absolutely. Uh, so first, when you do, when you put your transducer down on the patient, whether I would start in the transverse view, and you would look at your two vessels that you have on the screen, uh, usually the veins are double the size of the artery, but that's not always a good indication because sometimes the patient may have pathology and the veins and the arteries may be the same size. So the first thing you could do is you can uh, do a compression maneuver and you can see the vein walls coapting. So that right there will indicate that the vessel that is a vein, the vein walls coap, and the arteries you can see pulsate at this time. Another function you could do is put on your color flow Doppler and you can see the pulsation of the artery blinking at you where, I'm sorry, um, where the veins wink at you. So it's like a slow movement of color flow in the lumen of the vein because it's low flow velocity where the artery is high flow velocity. So there's gonna be a constant pulsation blinking at you with the color flow. Mm -hmm. And if you use a uh, pulsed wave Doppler, you can probably see that as well, right? And you can also utilize the pulse wave spectral Doppler and put the sample volume right inside the lumen just to give you an indication which is artery and vein. And again, the uh, pulsatility of the artery will show up on your Doppler where you would see the phasicity of a waveform for the venous flow. Okay. Uh, and um, one of the next questions uh, we got from Laura was, you stood the patient up during your video of the venous reflux exam. My practice protocol tells us to do this in the Trendelenburg position, which is correct. Well, I don't want to say which position is correct. It actually has to do with the patient, right? So the preferred position is standing, right? Because it maximizes hydrostatic pressure. However, standing comes with its own risk. Sometimes these patients, you know, faint. But if the patient has limited mobility and is unable to stand, you want to utilize the Trendelenburg position in order to get proper assessment of these veins. All right, we have a video here. Having the patient stand in the upright position will allow us to have a 360 degree view of their lower extremity and also increase hydrostatic pressure to elicit insufficiency of the superficial venous system. One of the best ways to accomplish this is to have your patient standing on a step stool that elevates the limb to the level of your scanning hand and also provides support for the patient to hold on to to stabilize during the exam. Always remember to keep an open line of communication with your patient 
and explain to them that they may feel dizzy at times, and if needed, they should tell you, and you should allow the patient to sit down and rest for a few moments. Okay, I guess this uh, explains yeah. it very, very nicely. Uh, anything else you want to add to that, uh, Julie? Um, no, I, again, it's really important that your communication with your patient, that you're constantly talking to them, making sure they're okay, you know, uh, asking them if they feel dizzy, lightheaded while they're standing, because it does happen, happens more often than ever. I mean, think about it, you're standing, it's a dark room, sometimes the room is hot, you, you're augmenting blood flow towards the heart. So, you know, again, communication with your patient is definitely key. Okay. Great, so we've got another question coming in from Ahmed this time, and he wants to know if an artery is occluded, is it possible to actually visualize the same artery further distal? I guess he's referring right. to the question so, that there is no blood flow there. Right, so if you have an occluded artery that uh, there, so it, what's, you know, the body is amazing. So sometimes you can have small segments of occlusion and then revascularization of blood flow distal to the occlusion. So what's important is, is to understand where the occlusion is with B-mode. Uh, you can see, you know, echogenicity of the plaque characteristics. Sometimes it's really um, uh, black and it's a, a, a fresh thrombus starting that's occluding a segment, or sometimes it's an old occlusion where it'd be bright white and calcified. So what I would do is, you know, assess this in B-mode, then with color, and then you can also see as you go distal, down the occlusion, revascularization, collateralization of blood flow. So for instance, if the superficial femoral artery has an occlusion, we know that the deep femoral artery is next to it, where the superficial femoral artery is basically the autobahn of the leg and the deep femoral artery uh, you know, branches out as it goes down. But the deep femoral artery is a, a good source of collateralization for the SFA. So usually if there's an occlusion in the proximal mid portion of the SFA, we will see revascularization um, in the distal region of the SFA through the deep femoral artery uh, in the Hunter Canal region by the above knee popliteal artery. And you can see this with color flow. Okay, so I guess a very important uh, uh, issue, you have to of course look at um, the, the collateral flow as well and you have to know your anatomy. Um, I think uh, at least when, when I try to image the legs, uh, it's sometimes very difficult to identify the in individual vessels. Do you have some tips for us or do we just have to know our anatomy better? Well, uh, anatomic landmarks is definitely crucial for the lower extremity. You know, as we start at the groin region, the inguinal region, you know, the femoral head, uh, we know that the common femoral artery and the distal iliac artery will see to the left and to the right of the femoral head. And then as we go down the leg, standing down in the longitudinal all transverse view, we'll actually see the bifurcation of the common femoral artery into the superficial femoral artery and the deep femoral artery. And then we know that the superficial femoral artery is the longest artery in the thigh, so we can just follow that down to the knee area. And then where we go to the knee area, we have the above knee and below knee popliteal artery, and then it bifurcates into the tibial vessels below the knee. So it is important to know the anatomy how where the vessels lie in the leg and also your anatomic landmarks with ultrasound okay so uh another question for me maybe uh, do you see a lot of variations in anatomy or abnormalities there or can you say this is usually how the anatomy is and you can use those landmarks to identify the individual vessels yeah i i agree with the second comment that you said you know this is the anatomic landmarks the femoral head um, the uh, tibial perineal trunk, we can see uh, the tibia bone and the fibia bone. So again, when we know our landmarks and our muscular tissues and, and, and where they're at, we know exactly what vessel we're looking at where in the leg. And it's pretty much standard for everybody. Um, in rare cases, you'll have abnormalities. But again, if you use your <clears throat> critical thinking skills, you'll be able to figure out where you're at. Okay. Okay, great. So, um, Another question we got in from Fabian was often when I am obtaining a waveform for a venous reflux exam, I see flow above and below the baseline. How can I be confident that I'm looking at true reflux and not at an artifact? This is a great question. And this is something a lot of sonographers struggle with. Um, 
when they first get into the uh, venous evaluation for reflux of the superficial and deep system. So all as I can say to you, it's important one, to know the knobology on your system. Know that your gains are set appropriately, your Doppler gains, when your spectro Doppler is activated. Make sure the sample gate is the appropriate size for that vessel. Make sure your beam steered appropriately, okay? And make sure your Doppler mm. scale is set to a low velocity to pick up venous flow. So you want your Doppler scale to be between 20 and 10. Also, you want to make sure, again, the gain on your knob is not too high set because you're going to pick up flow and above the baseline. If there's flow and above the baseline, mm -hmm. it is artifact. A true reflux waveform is uh, flow above the baseline, depending upon which direction you're intimating, and there will be nothing underneath it. So you'll have your augmentation of your waveform, which should be set below the baseline, and then the insufficiency above the baseline, and it will be a good, clear, spectral window. And again, you can use the knobology, which another feature is wall filter. If you decrease or increase your wall filter, we'll bring in this waveform really nicely. Okay, so thanks for answering this question. Um, I do want to maybe just um, uh, make you aware that currently we have an offer running. Uh, we call it the standout offer, uh, simply because, uh, of course, the turn of the year is usually a time when people make decisions about the new year. Uh, and where they make their New Year's resolution. And uh, we believe that ultrasound might be one of the things that you want to embark on in the new year. And that's why we make this standout offer uh, where uh, we, of course, uh, give you a very good price on all the content we have and on the courses here. You see we have several courses on echocardiography ranging from transesophageal echo. We've got our echo bachelor course and we've got the master class. We also have a number of uh, courses uh, dealing with point of care and emergency ultrasound as well as pediatric ultrasound. We have a course on abdominal ultrasound, very, very important, which is maybe also a connection to vascular because as you heard, we also will have a course on visceral vessels. And then a specific topic if you want to embark more on echocardiography, uh, which deals with speckle tracking, which is a new technology, which I believe is a breakthrough technology here. We now offer a MSK or musculoskeletal ultrasound course, a right heart course, and the course that Julie Cardozo uh, has uh, jointly produced with us on the lower extremities. So uh, this is, these are the courses that uh, we offer. And uh, let me just show you a very short teaser uh, to highlight uh, the promotion once more. So I do hope that we made you a little bit, I would say, curious of what we have in store for you. Um, we definitely want to make uh, learning easy for you and we want to help you to embark on this journey to learn ultrasound. Um, so uh, let me now come to the next question. Um, and this is a question which was asked by Peter. How do you identify pelvic congestion during a venous exam? Julie. Well. This is a good question. And, and again, we're going to be filming this course uh, coming up in this upcoming year, and we're going to take you through how to evaluate pelvic congestion and iliocable compression maneuvers um, through ultrasound. But right now, if we're incinating mm. and evaluating the venous system of the lower extremity, it's important that you not only focus on the vessel that you're, you're incinating, but also the surrounding tissue and any vessels coming from any other portions of the leg. So sometimes you will have uh, collaterals or tributaries coming from the groin region going into the saphenal femoral junction. So you want to see if there is um, any tributaries from there. And also with color flow Doppler, when you are assessing um, the uh, common femoral junction, you will get reversal flow in the epigastric vein. So this is always an indication of something going on above. So right now, as you can see, on our, our image here, uh, what we're going to be covering in our next course, this is a B-mode image of the uterus. And you can see on the right and the left hand, hand of the screen, the periuterine veins. Um, the next image you can see the color flow Doppler, and you can see uh, flow within these veins and also reflux in these veins. So this is the color flow right here. Right. So again, uh, 
a wonderful way of helping your patients and diagnosing things very, very easily. A question we got in from Ahmed is, what is the most difficult modality in vascular ultrasound? Is it the legs or is it the carotid arteries? <laughs> I honestly don't think there's any particular anatomy that's challenging. I think what's crucial is, is that we understand uh, the function of the ultrasound system and understand our probe maneuvering and understand the anatomy um, and how to use our probe maneuvers to visualize the anatomy. I think those are the challenging parts of ultrasound. It's not necessarily mm. the particular anatomy in each location. It's knowing how to use the function of the ultrasound system, knowing how to maneuver the probe, and knowing how to view these vessels in different views. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think this is a... Uh, interesting question because we get very similar questions also in other modalities of ultrasound. It's always the question of, you know, how can I actually accomplish the technique and what does it take to learn and sometimes also how long does it take to learn and, you know, it's a very difficult question to answer because it depends on so many factors. Um, I guess practice is something you definitely will need and you need a good understanding of uh, how to image, but also good understanding of pathophysiology. So uh, you obviously have to dig into the field, but the nice thing is, and that's my experience, that once you start with ultrasound, you very quickly get kind of a, a positive feedback uh, uh, and, and you, you already are able to diagnose very important things. So it's very, very uh, motivating even at the beginning. And certainly there's always more to learn. And as you go along, you'll get better and better. But it's not a thing that you, you know, you'd have to work on for maybe a year until you finally make your first diagnosis. Uh, some things are easier and some things are more difficult. Right, Julie? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, consistency in time. And uh, what I love about these e-learning programs is that you can really understand the basics of the anatomy, uh, the pathology, the physiology through online learning, and then understand the probe and how to utilize it and the ultrasound system, and then implement it uh, in your practice. Okay. So, you know, what, what um, I'm sometimes frequently asked is, can you actually learn ultrasound online? And, you know, um, I'll give you my take on this. Uh, I know the limitations. Uh, definitely, you know, I cannot hold the probe and show you how to move it, but we can get very close to this. What we do is we include a lot of demonstrations and we show you how to uh, move forward and what the tips and tricks are. So um, you will obviously be much better prepared when you go to the patient and when you image for the first time or when you want to excel with imaging. Um, and essentially, I think there, there's just no other way that you can learn any technique but uh, to you know, sit down either with books or videos uh, and learn it. And the advantage that we have with an online platform is that you obviously have an imaging technique which is, cannot be learned from books. And video is probably the very best, uh, next best thing to, to learn it by. And you also have this huge advantage that you can always go back to the videos and watch them again. This is something you cannot do if you go to a lecture. You cannot take the lecture with you. Uh, so this is a huge advantage. And um, you know, a lot of our users uh, take this advantage uh, and, and they definitely uh, use online courses to help them in progressing and getting better. But honestly said, I definitely you will need to put uh, the transducer on the patient at some point and, and learn how to image and, and get your experiences yourself. Uh, this is, I guess, the same with uh, playing piano or you know, learning how to play the guitar. An online course is probably the fastest way to get you up to speed, but then you will need to um, use your, your, your practical skills and to excel there. Good, right. so sure. anything else you wanna say regarding that topic, Julie? Uh, well, you know, it's important also to find uh, a good mentor, you know, someone who, you know, can basically simplify uh, the hands-on portion of the scan and, and just be patient with you because it is, it is hard, uh, especially if you never had the experience of imaging. So you need to find a facility or a clinic that's patient with you and that will take the time with you to scan and get that experience. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. You know, it's, uh, sometimes I see that there's a little bit of a... Um, 
uh, I would say fear of ultrasound systems because they've got so many buttons and knobs and, and people are afraid uh, to use the machines. Uh, my experience though is, is when you start imaging, you will realize you don't need most of the buttons anyway. You can just, just start with the basic functions and you know, the ultrasound vendors um, are aware of this and they, they kind of strip down some of the machines, especially if you look at handheld machines or uh, mobile transportable machines. They definitely are much, much easier to use as well. And then there's always certain functions that are automated anyway. So you usually have a button that optimizes the image quality. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to say here that you should not use these buttons and maybe optimize uh, your, your images, but uh, nevertheless, uh, you should not be afraid of uh, the complexity of ultrasound. Um, it's not as complex as it seems. And um, I guess one of the big areas that is moving along very, very quickly is point of care ultrasound and I, I truly believe that at some point we'll all be using ultrasound as um, maybe substitute for the stethoscope at some point. So yeah, it's um, really let's, okay, so let's uh, come to another question. This is a question from Lee and uh, the question is when should I use CEAP and when should I use VCSS for scoring venous symptoms? All right, well, this is a good question, and it's important to understand that the SEEP classification and the Venus Clinical Severity Score are complementary, but different in their purposes. Where the SEEP, as you can see here, it breaks down the classification, um, scores the patient based on their pathology and their history, where the VCSS score covers the immediate symptoms of the patient. Okay, so and uh, I guess... Yeah, I guess we all should know uh, the scoring system, right? Uh, when assessing patients with a venous disease, um, it's important to understand both systems and how they complement each other. Like again, the SEEP score is the history of the patient and how they're presenting. So it talks about etiology classification, whether it's congenital, primary, secondary, or if there's no venous causes identified. It talks about the anatomy, where, where it is. In the, in, the, in, the, in the venous system, whether it's superficial veins, the deep veins, or the perforators. And then it talks about the pathology of the patient. If you go to the next slide, you can see the, uh, the pathophysiology of the patient, whether it's just reflux or it's obstruction, meaning a DVT, or it's both reflux and a DVT obstruction. Okay. So here is a, a slide from the venous clinical severity scoring. Do you want to just say a few words about right. that? You see, there's different questions and how we score them. Uh, basically, it covers their immediate symptoms of the patient, you know, their pain, where the varicosities are, how significant the edema is, uh, if they were compression stockings. If you go ahead and go to the next slide. Oh, this is the next question already. So this is the last slide I have on venous clinical severity scoring. Um, Julie, uh, when, when it comes to these scoring systems, uh, where can you look these things up? <laughs> the, well, the American Venus Forum has a number of references. There's a European Venus Forum that has reference to these scoring systems. Um, it's not always implemented worldwide yet, but and here in, in the States, we have a standard of care where we're implementing the VCSS score and the SEEP score with initial evaluation of the patient and also score on them based on how, after their procedures and it's for each extremity. It just gives us a, a good indication of how the patient is doing and to manage them better. Okay. Uh, we got a question here from Frank and he wants to know, uh, when it comes to the venous system, how do you write a report? I guess it's a very broad question here, but uh, mm -hmm. reporting is obviously an issue. What does your report look like and what kind of uh, specific points do you include here? Right. So again, it, it depends upon what you're in. So let's just take, for example, uh, to rule out venous thrombosis. So it'd be a venous patency evaluation. You want to just tell on your report what vessels you were insulating with B-mode and color and Doppler. Uh, so we'd say, you know, utilizing B-mode, color flow and Doppler, the common femoral vein, the femoral vein, the popliteal vein, the gastrocnemius vein, soleus vein, all the veins that you assessed were imaged for PNC. Um, there's no evidence of deep vein thrombosis if the veins are compressible. And then you also want to mention the phasicity of the venous flow. So you want to note that in the deep system, the venous flow is phasic and varies with respiration. Because when we assess venous flow, if there's difference in the phasicity 
or uh, can indicate obstruction either above or below where we're at or insufficiency. So these are all clues that you want to put in your report. So you want to identify the B-mode imaging of these vessels and the Doppler. Right. Do you also use any measurements? We only use measurements of diameter and time when we're assessing for insufficiency of the deep and the superficial system. The diameter measurements would be of the superficial veins, which would be uh, you know, the, the saphenous veins, uh, any perforators uh, that connect the deep and the superficial system, the deep system. We would use diameter measurements from the anterior to the posterior wall of how big these vessels are. And then we would utilize spectral Doppler and measure the time of insufficiency in these particular veins. And then also okay. the time would be utilized in the deep system as well. Okay, so fantastic. So let's uh, come to another question that was asked uh, before we started the webinar, and that is the topic of arterial evaluation protocol and techniques. And Adrian wants to know, can you explain how to evaluate the arteries and veins properly at the upper limbs to plan an AV fistula, or I guess to diagnose an AV fistula? Right, so a preoperative mapping, it's important that you assess the vein of uh, basically the cephalic and the basilic vein. You wanna assess these veins for their diameter and the patency. So you wanna make sure there's no thrombus within these veins. You wanna make sure they're good caliper to make sure they can use for the fistula. And also it's important that you assess the brachial and the radial arteries to make sure that the flow is phasic and, and that there's no obstruction or stenosis in this flow. And also the diameter. Uh, how deep these vessels are in the, in the upper extremity. Mm -hmm. Just a question for me again as a cardiologist, what we are always uh, very much aware of is that if we perform catheterizations either from the groin to the femorals or maybe from the, the radial artery, uh, it's always the issue of fistulas, but it's also the issue of hematomas. And um, you know, one of the things that are being used uh, to treat these are just compression with a transducer. Can you just comment uh, on what your take here is and when this makes sense and what the indications are maybe to go towards surgery? Um, well, uh, for instance, we have patients come in post-operative catheterization, whether it's through the brachial artery or the common femoral artery. Again, you want to get a lay of the land of these vessels to rule out any AV fistulas or pseudoaneurysms. Uh, and document them appropriately. Because again, once a pseudoaneurysm is, is diagnosed, we want to identify where the neck is, where the connection is, and the diameter. And then we're going to perform a compression maneuver, uh, holding steady pressure on this neck for at least 20 minutes to see if we can get this vessel to close off uh, this pouch of the pseudoaneurysm and then reassess it. Um, we evaluate these patients. We do this uh, compression maneuver first. And then we'll reassess them a couple of days later. Um, at that time, usually the physician takes them off of anticoagulation, so the, the pseudo will close. So we'll evaluate the patient the next day. And if the neck and the diameter are larger than a certain percentage, then they will have to go and either get a thrombus injection, which we'll do in office, or they'll have to go for surgery to tie off the actual vessel. Mm -hmm. So it all depends upon the diameter of the neck and the effectiveness of the compression maneuver, if we can close that aneurysm or the fistula. In your experience, how often are you successful? Or is that very difficult to say? Probably depends on the oh, size of the well, pseudoaneurysm. Yeah, it depends on the size of the pseudoaneurysm. Also depends upon the patient. You know, Excuse me. Body. <laughs> uh, patient body habitus, again, is a big factor. If you have a morbidly obese patient, it's gonna be harder to penetrate deeper. And again, you wanna keep steady pressure of compression in this area. Um, so at that time, if we are, don't have good um, success with the compression maneuver, we'll usually do uh, ultrasound guided thrombus injection into where the neck is to close off that neck. And if that's not effective, then they'll go to surgery. But usually we do it the conservative way. Uh, God, I, I don't think we've ever, I mean, maybe one time in my career, we sent a patient for a surgery to tie off. So it's, it's a unlikely, not often seen complication. Okay, well, that's, that's great to hear. Uh, we got a question from Slatka, and she wants to know how often would you use ultrasound uh, to get a venous access? Uh, I guess she's referring to, uh, I guess, the arteries or the veins. I don't know what, but generally, how often would you use um, um, ultrasound to do that? Always, always. Uh, so anytime we're accessing a vein uh, for a vascular procedure, uh, endovascular procedure uh, for the veins for a, a sclerotherapy or ablation, mm -hmm. Ultrasound is definitely the standard 
uh, to use to get access into these vessels. Mm -hmm. And yeah, also I, I when this... they use cellular access, they use ultrasound to uh, get access. So uh, I, it's pretty standard all the time yeah. we use it. Yeah. It's appropriate way to answer that. Yeah. It, you know, this is interesting because I do see that uh, this the procedure of using ultrasound is varies greatly depending on where you are. And uh, there's uh, many centers who do not use it yet. And, uh, you know, there's maybe also a lack of expertise in using ultrasound. Um, especially, again, I come from the cardiology arena. I must say that it's probably underutilized uh, for, for vascular access uh, to perform heart catheterization. So I guess uh, we still have a lot to learn from the vascular experts uh, because it's a neat way and you obviously have a higher um, you know, success rate if you use ultrasound. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, let's come to another question asked by Vanessa and she wants to know how can I best optimize my image when visualizing varying degrees of stenosis? Well, this is a great question and can be answered in multiple ways. Uh, first of all, you want to look at the plaque characteristics in B mode, as you can see in this image right here. So you can see we have a uh, different echogenicity within the lumen. So we're not really sure <clears throat> what the degree of stenosis is. Uh, so then we would utilize the color flow function and we're going to look for aliasing of the color flow. And as you can see right there in the middle of our lumen, we see aliasing and a narrowing of the plaque right here to the left. Right there, yeah. So, right in this situation, I would want to utilize the spectral pulse wave Doppler and uh, get a sample of what that velocity is within that lumen. So, you can see that <clears throat> the velocity is over 400 centimeters a second. So, in order to categorize this we, by the diagnostic criteria, we need to know what the ratio is. So, we want to get the velocity of the blood flow right before the stenosis and see what the ratio is if it's a two to one ratio three to one or four to one and that will categorize what the uh, stenosis is so we can see right here that the pre stenosis waveform is 39 so we want to see how many times uh 39 goes into 400 and automatically we know that this is a greater than 70 percent stenosis in this particular section of the superficial femoral artery then when we're done, we want to evaluate the post-stenotic uh, flow because we want to see the effect of the hemodynamics of the stenosis of the waveform distal to where the stenosis is. So as you can see, it's monophasic and it's turbulent. And we also saw that with the color flow Doppler as well. So let's go ahead, go to the next clip. And we can see further down the same vessel, uh, we have another different plaque characteristics with B mode. Now, again, it's hard to tell what the stenosis diameter is because again, we're looking at a two dimensional view, right? So we utilize our color flow Doppler, as you can see right here, the next clip. And you can see again, there's aliasing and we also see a collateralization coming in from the bottom of our screen, which is really neat. Um, then we wanna utilize our spectral pulse wave Doppler to see what the velocity within this aliasing is. And you can see here, it's, uh, I can't see, uh, it's 180. So again, we don't know what the pre-velocity is. We want to get the pre-stenosis waveform right before our aliasing is. And you can see that it's 64. So we want to divide 64 into 150 to see what the ratio is. And here is a two to one. So this would be 50% stenosis. And then also we want to see the effect of flow post stenosis. And as you can see in this spectral Doppler waveform, that it's dampened and it's monophasic, which would be normal for this vessel because, again, there's two stenosis. So there's tandem stenosis, one proximal in the superficial femoral artery of greater than 70% that already had an effect on the, on the blood flow hemodynamics. And then we had another stenosis of 50%. So, of course, the post stenotic flow to these two stenosis would be dampened and monophasic. So this would be a, a good indication. And say, for instance, if you put your transducer down and you saw this waveform with your Doppler, you automatically want to think, okay, proximal to where I'm incinating, there has to be an obstruction because my flow in this particular section is dampened and monophasic. So you want to be a good investigator and find out where the stenosis is and what the percentage is. Okay, I guess uh, this was a lecture in its own, and I think a very, very precise, uh, you know, demonstration of how we can quantify uh, stenosis and lesions. Uh, we got a question from Akpa, and he wants to know how, which terminology would you use to describe a plaque? 
Well, it depends upon the characteristic that it displays on B mode. So right now, the criteria for plaque characteristic is for B mode and basically has to do with the echogenicity of the plaque that we see. And also the characteristics, whether it's irregular, if it's ulcerated, or if it's uh, smooth. So it's smooth along the lumen of the wall. Um, calcified, as you can see in this vessel here in B mode, there's different plaque characters, brightness of the plaque within the lumen. So this would be heterogeneous with mixed calcification. So the bright, bright white part would be calcified and the low level grayness of the echoes within this lumen would be hetero. Um, also, you can see that it's irregular in shape. It's not consistent and smooth along the anterior and the posterior wall of the lumen. So this would be categorized as irregular uh, hetero slash calcified plaque. But we don't know the severity right? because we're looking at a two-dimensional view. So we cannot classify it as mild, moderate, severe. We can only classify it by what we see, the BMO characteristics. Right, and definitely you would need uh, the Doppler uh, measurements to, to quantify the severity. But, you know, sometimes what I see is it's very, very difficult to really appreciate those very, very soft plaques. Um, and, uh, you know, if you only use, obviously, 2D, you might miss such a plaque. And, um, and, and that is certainly something you should be aware of. Uh, do you have any tips for our users how we can optimize the 2D image and what we should do so that we don't miss these soft plaques? Yeah, absolutely. So again, you have to utilize your detective skills. You know, sometimes you want to use your, uh, you know, your knobology on your system to actually zoom in on this vessel and, and, and uh, increase your TGCs or your Doppler gains in that area. Or sometimes you may have to decrease the frequency of the transducer to pick up the uh, different shades of gray within the lumen. But color flow is definitely a big help uh, setting your scale appropriately you can figure out if that vessel is really occluded with color flow and Doppler. So you always want to confirm what you're seeing with B mode, with color and Doppler. So if you see a lumen that has low levels of echogenicity with inside, you know, okay, let me put my color flow on. Let me see if I can pick up flow within this mm -hmm. color flow. And again, color flow is mean velocity. So it's not always going to pick up the velocity. So that's why you want to use the next step, which is spectral pulse wave Doppler, which picks up the peak. Right. So then you throw that in there, you make sure your Doppler scale set appropriately, right, to pick up arterial flow. And if there's no flow there, you're confident that that is an occlusion or an obstruction. OK, uh, just a question. Would you ever use contrast? Uh, well, we are just getting into contrast for vascular. We particularly don't really use it right now uh, because, again, we are pretty sufficient as far as documenting our vessels would be more colorful and Doppler, but we have used them in some cases, again, with patients with higher BMI, we pretty much use them for. Right before, on. because again, we want to prevent the patient from going to the angio suite to get exposed to radiation if possible. We want to get that clinical question answered if we can by ultrasound. Okay. Thanks, uh, Julie. We're running a little bit late, but I do want to answer one more question, uh, or have you answer one more question that came up. And that is a question from David, and he wants to know, how do you optimize the image for deeper structures? Well, again, I believe, David, this is a great question. And this is something we all tackle in our vascular lab, in our imaging lab, and uh, or whatever lab we're utilizing ultrasound. Again, it's important to understand the knobology of the system and the transducer that we're utilizing. Mm. So for, for structures, if you can't see a vessel greater than four centimeters depth with your linear transducer, you want to make sure you can decrease the frequency because that transducer has a set of frequencies that you can evaluate the vessels at maybe seven to 12 megahertz. You want to make sure, let me decrease my frequency to seven to integrate deeper into the body. And if I can't pick up the vessel, I want to switch to the curvilinear transducer, which is a low frequency transducer that will help me visualize this vessel. And then okay, play well. with your, your TGCs. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, use different techniques, use different transducers. And I guess it's also a matter of practicing to get good image quality and to, of course, optimize your image recognition skills so that you are able to identify the problem, even if the image quality is maybe not as good. So um, right. um, coming. Thinking critically too, critical thinking, like what, what can I do? And knowing how the system works and how the probes work help with the assessment. Right. 
Judy, do you have one last tip maybe for our users, um, how they can um, not only embark on the journey of using Vasco Ultrasound, but also some tips uh, of how they can speed up the process of learning? Uh, well, the process of learning, uh, I guess my tip is communication, right? Uh, make sure you effectively communicate with whoever your teacher or instructor may be that's teaching you ultrasound. You know, not being afraid to say, look, I'm struggling with this area. How do I know? And also, if they don't know, to provide you resources and to communicate effectively with your patient. I mean, you can get a lot of information from your patient just by talking to them and asking them about the event that they had to answer the clinical question for the doctor and communicating with the physician, like, what is the question I need to answer? Um, so again, I believe communication is key, effective communication. Yeah, well, I think uh, this sums up uh, the webinar very, very nicely. I uh, really want to thank you for being with us and for answering all these questions. I know there's a number of different questions which haven't been answered yet, but I can promise you we'll answer these questions by mail or send you the answer uh, because I think um, it's very important that you really get the most out of what we do. And I also want to mention that we have another webinar coming up. Uh, this time it will be more my topic. It'll be the topic of echocardiography at 7 p.m. So if you want to join that as well, we'll have uh, Martin Altersberger with us, who's going to be uh, here to answer your questions. We already have a bunch of questions that came in. And uh, of course, we will definitely repeat this uh, Q&A session with Julie. And um, in the future, hope to either see you in one of our courses or maybe in one of our Q&A sessions or webinars. So thanks again for being with us. And Julie, thanks for being with us to answer all these questions. Thank you for having me.